did you know? A Hat in Time originally began as a one-man project by Danish indie developer Jonas Karlev, who initially wanted to make something to put on his resume. Over time, the game's team Gears for Breakfast grew to eight people from Denmark, the United States, the UK, and Australia. Early development was done entirely by volunteers with no actual budget going into it. The project led to a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter, with the initial goal of $30,000. The campaign raised more than $60,000 in the first two days, and ultimately raised $296,000 $360. During this time, the bulk of the team never actually met face to face, with each member working on their own and submitting the work to the rest of the team online. Because of their smaller size, many members of the team were forced to take multiple roles. Art director William T. Nichols also worked as a level designer, and Karlev had a hand in programming, animation, scripting, and marketing. Early in its life, A Hat in Time was a fairly different kind of game. The project's original direction was a 3D hack and slash adventure game with platforming elements. However, Karlev realized the game's platforming elements were more appealing than its combat, and the title was retooled as a platformer. The team was motivated by a notable absence of three-dimensional collectathon platforming games in recent years. In an interview with Polygon, Karlev partially attributed the lack of platformers to one game in particular, saying, I don't want to blame it all on Donkey Kong 64, but it's partially at fault. Donkey Kong 64 did a lot of things wrong in that it's very tedious to collect everything in order to move on. A lot of people don't want that. They want to breathe through the game if they so desire, but there are also people who want to collect everything and get stronger and better. While Donkey Kong 64 leaned too much on collectibles, the team felt that Banjo-Kazooie struck the right balance, and they aimed to do the same. Other titles that inspired a hat in time were Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Psychonauts. The game also had some real-world inspirations. The first area of the game, Mafia Town, was inspired by the Greek island Santorini, which which can be seen in its white buildings and blue rooftops. Due to the decline of 3D platforming, the team were worried that A Hat in Time wouldn't be well received by the gaming community. Prior to the launch of their Kickstarter, Karlev even considered dropping the game's fundraising goal from $30,000 to $20,000. This amount wouldn't be enough to fund development, but the project had been entirely volunteer-based up to that point and simply needed any kind of budget to continue. While drawing heavily from games in the past, the team also made tweaks to ensure A Hat in Time would appeal to modern gamers. Karlev acknowledged that games of the past could rely on simple goals and objectives, but players today desire interesting stories and characters. The team also worked hard to ensure that A Hat in Time was large without feeling empty or shallow. One aspect of the game that proved to be particularly challenging was the inclusion of co-op mode, which was originally one of the game's stretch goals on Kickstarter. In order to keep this mode fun for everyone playing, the developers made it impossible for players to bump into or kill each other in co-op. Another part of the game that changed during development was the function of the game's badges. Early on, the game's badges were a primary source of new abilities for Hat Kid. However, the abilities were ultimately transferred to hats, while badges were used for upgrades and secondary abilities. Early footage of A Hat in Time gained attention from fans for its colorful aesthetic and cel-shaded graphics, drawing many favorable comparisons to The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. However, the game's visual style evolved greatly over the course of its development. When Carlab first began the project by tinkering with the Unreal Engine development kit, the game had a more washed-out color palette that was heavy on grays. This was not by design, but rather because of a default setting in the Unreal Engine that automatically dulled by 10%. Cell-shaded graphics were a deliberate design choice, though, for reasons more economical than aesthetic. Karlev explained, The cell-shaded style is kind of easy to make something pretty without having to put a lot of effort into it. That sounds cheap, but it's kind of the truth. We want to make something look good, but that allows us as a small team to make it fast, without wasting millions of dollars into just a single strand of hair. The use of cell-shaded graphics allowed the team to hide seams in the characters' models, and use less detailed textures. The first song composed for the game's soundtrack was the Moon Jumpers theme. Since the game's composer, Pascal Michael Stifel, didn't know where the song would ultimately end up in the game, he wrote a song to reflect a Hat in Time's feel as a whole. Since it wasn't yet tied to any specific area of the game, the Moon Jumpers theme was the first heard on the title screen of the game's playable alpha build. The game also contains several secrets. The game's projectile badge appears to be a reference to Super Mario RPG. If the player equips the badge and attacks, Hat Kid fires a beam that shoots out a thin line and then expands. Three stars also appear as the beams being charged. This is extremely similar to Gino's star beam attack. There's also a series of easter eggs hidden throughout the entire game. There are dozens of hamburgers hidden all around a hat in time's world in obscure places, most of which are yet to be discovered. Another interesting fact is that the game's interiors aren't actually there. The depth behind the windows in Mafia Town comes from box projected cube maps that are essentially an illusion of space. This technique is also used in Dead Bird Basement in Alpine Skyline. Another illusion takes place in Hat Kid's spaceship. The ship's geometry doesn't make 
make sense in a 3D space, as many rooms overlap with one another. The game hides chunks of geometry depending on which room the player is in to make it all seem plausible. In the spaceship bedroom, there's a secret pillow fort containing Hat Kid's diary. Players can only read the diary entry for the previous mission, and the diary becomes accessible after the player unlocks Subcon Forest. However, there are unaccessible diary entries for earlier missions. Earlier builds of the game include content that was hidden, unfinished, or changed in later versions. The beta version includes five unused cutscenes, four from Mafia Town, and one specifically tied to Mafia HQ. The Mafia HQ scene is also labeled Rhythm Segment, suggesting that there could have been a rhythm game inspired portion of the level at some point. In the alpha version of the game, there's an island that can't be reached by normal means. On the island is a tent containing a chalkboard with a warning message that reads, You should not be here. Leave or I will send Queen Vanessa after you. These players always trying to break my level design, grumble. This island also exists in the beta version and contains a more lighthearted message signed WTN, most likely short for William T. Nichols, the game's art director. On the other side of the island is a tombstone with an engraved message featuring an easily decipherable alphabet. When decoded, the message reads, Here lies my dad who loved me with all of his heart and knew that I could always be a success in all that I did. If you want more 3D platformer facts, check out the Digino Gaming video on Super Mario Sunshine. And as for those players that keep breaking Jonas's level design, well, uh, guilty. If you want to see far beyond the boundaries and many more secrets to either this game or any of your other favorite 3D platformers, consider clicking on the playlist for my show Boundary Break here on the screen or in the video description down below.